What's up, my sad stars? I'm Michael Princhak, and if you want to be highly successful on the AP Statistics exam, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You have to be good when working with the normal distribution. You have to know how to do it, you have to know what it is, and you gotta be really good at it. Now listen, here's the deal. The normal distribution is really, really easy, but if you're good at it, there's tons of questions on the AP exam that you're gonna get right. So what I want to do in this video is talk to you about the normal distribution and look at a couple different situations where the normal distribution is going to be used. Now, I'm going to use normal CDF and invert norm on my TID4 calculator to find probabilities and proportions within the normal distribution and to look up z-scores. If you don't want to use the TID4 calculator, you can use the equivalent functions on a Casio calculator, or you can always go really old school and use the z-tables provided for you in the AP Stats formula section. Now listen, here's the deal. The normal model is king. So you better know how to use it, and it all starts with the formula for a z-score. A z-score is a particular value minus its mean divided by a standard deviation. And if your data falls in normal distribution, we could take any particular value in that distribution, convert it to a z-score, and then use the normal model to find a proportion, probability, above, below, in between, whatever we want to find. So what I want to show you in this video is a couple of examples of really good questions that could easily come up on this year's AP exam where the normal model is used. Now there's all different situations, so I'm going to hit on a couple of the most important ones. But basically, if you read a problem and it says that the distribution follows a normal model or a normal distribution or it's approximately normal, well, guess what? You're going to use the normal model. Now, it also works with sampling distributions. Sampling distributions can be normal as long as all the conditions are met. Whether it's a sampling distribution for sample means or sampling distribution for sample proportions, the normal model can be used if you confirm that, well, it follows a normal distribution. And that should be happening in most cases. So let's dive into a couple problems where we're going to use the normal model to help us solve some problems for probability, proportions, percentages, all that fun stuff. And I promise you will see some of these problems on the AP exam. Maybe not the exact same problems, but ones of very similar concepts. So let's take a look at them right now. So the normal model could be used in many situations. Anytime the problem states that the continuous random variable falls in approximate normal distribution, you might have a mean and a standard deviation, you could use the normal model. Also, when you're working with combining random variables, and each individual random variable falls in normal model, when you combine them, that falls in normal distribution as well. And even in sampling distributions where the conditions have been checked for it to be approximately normal, then we can find the mean and standard deviation of that sampling distribution and use the normal model. This is, of course, where we could actually create and find p-values for significant sets. So again, normal distribution really is key. Now, the normal distribution all centers on z-scores. Make sure you really know how to find a z-score. It's really, really simple. And it's actually the same formula for a t-score, by the way but you take an individual value, that's what x is, and this x always corresponds to this particular z-score. Now, to find that z-score, we need the mean of the normal distribution and the standard deviation of the normal distribution. It's really that simple. Let's take a look at several examples where the normal model can be used. This first example says the sleep time of teenagers follows a normal distribution. That's awesome. That's what we need to know. The mean time is 6.8 hours with the standard deviation of 0.7 hours. So we know the mean is 6.8 hours. We know the standard deviation is 0.7 hours. Now this first question says, what percent of teenagers get more than eight hours of sleep? So on that normal distribution, we want to look above eight. So the question is asking us to find the probability that somebody's sleep time is greater than eight hours. So the first thing we got to do is get the z-score for eight. Once again, that's the value of interest. Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. On the standard normal model, which is based on z-scores, eights would be 1.714 standard deviations above the mean. Now, to actually get that probability, we then have to go to that standard normal model where we're no longer looking at S, number of sleep hours being greater than 8. We're looking at a z-score being greater than 1.714. Now, to get that answer, this is where we're going to use our calculator. We're going to go second VARS, and we're going to select normal CDF. Normal CDF can find, calc can find probabilities, percents, proportions, above z-scores, below z-scores, or in between two z-scores. Just to make sure you know how it works, it goes from a lower z-score to an upper z-score. So I want to look greater than 1.714, so my lower value is going to be 1.714. And my upper value is going to essentially be infinity, but I don't have an infinity button in the calculator, so I'm going to use a 99, or a 999, whatever you want to use. Now, you don't have to write normal CDF on your paper, especially if it's an FRQ. They don't want to see calculator talk. They just want to see you properly notating it. So i got a final answer of 0.0433. 
So that's what you want to write down. It's good. Your work should look exactly like I'm showing mine right here. And it's really not overly difficult. We just got to make sure we take the time to notate what we're asked, find that z-score, notate that z-score in the standard normal model, and then go ahead and find that probability. All right, let's look at another one here. So different situations still resulting in sleep, but again, different situation. Maybe this is a different country. The sleep time of teenagers falls in normal distribution. The mean time is 6.8 hours and a standard deviation of 0.7 hours. If a teenager is selected at random, what is the probability that they will sleep or they will have between 5.5 and 7.5 hours of sleep? Okay, now we're looking in between two values. So I got to find the z-score for each of those values. We're looking for the sleep time in between. I actually got that sign wrong there. This should be a less than sign. Sorry about that. So we're looking for the sleep time to be in between 5.5 and 7.5. So we're going to get the z-score for 5.5, the z-score for 7.5, and then we're going to go to that standard normal model and look in between negative 1.857 and 1. Once again, I grab that calculator, second vars, go down to normal CDF, and we're going to go from a lower value of negative 1.857 to an upper value of one. Just a quick reminder, I get a lot of kids that their calculator says error because they use the minus button instead of the negative button. So be very careful. It's a negative value, you wanna use the negative button, not the minus button. And we get a probability of 0 0.8096, would actually round to about 0 0.81. Not too difficult there. Nice and simple. All right, let's totally change gears now. We're still gonna focus on sleep time of teenagers, but we're gonna give a different kind of perspective here. So the sleep time of teenagers falls in normal distribution. Maybe this is in Germany instead of America. Who knows? A sleep time of 4.5 hours is at the 15th percentile. So what we're giving you in this problem is a specific value and we're given its percentile. So if we're looking at that standard normal model, below 4.5 hours is 15% of kids. Remember, percentile is the percentage below. Now, if the standard deviation is 0.5 hours, what is the mean sleep time? So to solve this one, the first thing we got to do is figure out the z-score because we have our z-score formula and we know a particular value is 4.5 and we know there's 15% below it. But this is the beauty of invert norm on your calculator. Invert norm, second vars, go down to invert norm, it gives you z-scores. All you have to do is give it an area. Now, if you have one of the newer T84 calculators, you could do the area to the left, that's below, the area in the center, that's in the middle, or the area above or to the right. If you have an older calculator, it's don't even having that option for tail. It automatically goes to the bottom. So, but the definition of a percentile is the percentage below or to the left. So I'm actually going to leave it on left and type in an area of 0.15. And this is going to give me that Z score that has 15% below it. And that Z score is negative 1.036. Again, on your paper for an FRQ, do not put invert norm. They don't want to see that, but you do have to get the Z score. You could also use a normal table to look up that Z score if you want. So now I'm going to start off with that z-score form, and I'm going to substitute everything I know. The value of 4.5 corresponds to a z-score of negative 1.036, which has 15% below it. All of those numbers are intertwined. We do not know the mean. That's what we're solving for, but we were told the standard deviation is 0.5. Now at this point, we just got to show off our algebra skills. We're simply going to multiply the 0.05 over, subtract the 4.5, but be careful because that does leave a negative on that mu. So we're going to times both sides by negative one, which is going to undo that negative. And we get 5.018 hours would be the average sleep time in this particular population, where again, the standard deviation is 0.5 and 4.5 hours at the 15th percentile. All right, let's do another one similar to this, but this time we're asking for the mean. We don't know the standard deviation. See questions like this all the time on the AP exam. So once again, maybe this is now a different country, maybe India, a sleep time of nine hours at the 95th percentile. That means that 95% of teenagers in the population sleep under nine hours. If the mean sleep time is 7.2, what's the standard deviation? Well, the first thing I got to do is get a z-score. I got to get a z-score that represents that 95th percentile. Again, if you've got a z-table, you can look it up. But on the TID4 calculator, I'm going to go and grab invert norm. Once again, I'm going to leave it on left because a percentile is the area to the left. I'm going to type in 0.95, and this is going to get me the z-score in that standard normal model that has 95% below it, 1.645. All right, now I'm going to set up that z-score formula. The z-score is 1.645, and that's the z-score that has 95% below it, which in this model is a value of 9. 
we were given the mean of 7.2, and this time we're solving for that standard deviation. Again, all we have to do is show off our algebra skills. We're going to multiply the standard deviation over 9, point, or 9 minus 7.2 is the 1.8, and then we're going to divide the 1.645 over to get a standard deviation of 1.095 hours in this particular population. Again, some really nice questions that aren't too bad, but they come up all the time on the exam. All right, now we're going to move into sampling distributions. Now, sampling distributions, we're no longer looking at individuals. You're looking at samples. So the sleep time of teenagers falls in normal distribution. The mean time is 6.8 hours. The standard deviation is 0 0.7 hours. That was the question we started off with. But now we're going to say in a random sample of 50 random teenagers, what is the probability that the sample mean is less than 6.5 hours? So we're no longer talking about a single teenager. That's what we would use the 6.8 and the 0 0.7. We're talking about a sample of 50. So we can't use a, a, the, the normal model that we've been using with a mean of 6.8 and a standard deviation of 0.7. We have to refer to that sampling distribution that shows all possible sample means of size 50 drawn from this population. Now, when we're thinking about that sampling distribution, we've got to think about the center, the spread, and the shape. First, the center is the mean. Notice my use of symbols here. I'm no longer just using mu. I'm using mu sub x bar because a sampling distribution has a bunch of means in it. So we're talking about the mean of all the means. And yes, some means are going to be more than 6.8 and some are going to be less than 6.8, but the mean of all of them should be the true population mean 6.8. That's pretty easy. Next up comes the standard deviation. Once again, I'm not just using sigma anymore. I'm using sigma sub x bar. This is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution filled with sample means. Now, remember, bigger samples vary less. So on average, 50 teenagers should vary way less than a single teenager. And the formula to understand that change of variance is to take the standard deviation of the population and divide by the square root of your sample size, and I get 0 0.0990. Now, just as a quick reminder, we should be checking our conditions. The center is only going to be 6.8 if our samples are random. Well, they are. And the standard deviation can only be calculated if we can assume our samples are independent of each other. And as long as our sample of 50 is under 10% of the population, which has got to be hundreds of thousands of teenagers, we're safe to assume that that is going to be true so we could assume independence. Now, the last thing we need is the shape to be normal. Because here's the cool thing, sampling distributions, the population can actually be non-normal, but the sampling distribution will still be normal as long as we meet the condition. Now, there's two conditions. One, this, if the population is already normal, which this one is, then technically any sample size would work. Any sampling distribution based on a sample size of 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 50 is going to be normal. But the central limit theorem says that you don't even have to worry about the population shape if your sample size is more than 30, and in this case, we meet that. So we definitely know that our sample distribution is going to be normal. So now I'm going to go back and answer the question. Now that I have built the model, the normal distribution model for this sampling distribution, I can answer the question. What is the probability that a mean of 50, and some kids actually like put a little sub 50 here just to understand that it's a mean of 50 students, is less than 6.5? Well, same process. First thing I got to do is get a z-score. I'm going to take 6.5 minus 6.8, but this time I'm dividing by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, 0 0.0990, because again, bigger samples vary less. Get a z-score of negative 3.03, and then I have to now look at a standard normal model where that z-score is, and I want to look below it because I'm looking less than 6.5. This is where I'm going to go and grab normal CDF one more time here, and we're going to look lower. So this time we're going to start at a lower value of negative 99. That's acting like my negative infinity. We're going to go an upper value of negative 3.03. And I get a pretty low probability here of 0 0.00122. So it's a pretty unlikely for this to happen, 0 0.0122. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it would be pretty unlikely for a sample of 50 teenagers to have a mean sleep time of less than 6.5 hours. Now, why would that be? Well, again, yes, 6.5 is really close to 6.8. So you'd be like, well, that should be likely, not unlikely. Well, I mean, it's a sample of 50. Yeah, one teenager could easily sleep less than 6.5 hours, but on an average, a group of 50, they should be way, way closer to that mean of 6.8. So again, this is showing how I could use the normal distribution in sampling distributions as well. And let's look at another one. This time we're going to work at a sampling distribution with sample proportions. According to an environmental website, 35% of Americans recycle a plastic water bottle after using it. 
What is the probability that in random sample of 150 Americans, more than 40% will recycle a plastic water bottle after using it? All right, well, first off, in the population, it's not normal at all. It's actually just very simple. It's 35% do it, 65% don't. I mean, that's not a normal distribution whatsoever. That's just yes or no. But the sampling distribution is showing what all possible sample proportions could look like of size 150. You know, if I get a sample of 150 people, I might get 35% that recycle. I might get 36. I might get 41. I might get 42. I might get 27. They're going to vary. So the sampling distribution is filled with all of those possible P hats of size 150 from this particular population. So what we have to do is we got to build that sampling distribution and hope that it's going to be normal. Let's start off with the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean of all those P hats, well, some are going to be more than 35%, some are going to be less, but if the truth is 35%, that's what we should see in the center. Now, again, all of those different P hats are numbers and numbers are going to vary. So the standard deviation of all of those P hats, and again, this is the formula for a one sample uh, proportion for a sampling distribution. It's going to be on the formula sheet, but it's a pretty simple formula. Giant square root, and inside that square root is going to be your sample per, or your population proportion, excuse me, 0.35 times 1 minus it, 0.65, and then divided by your sample size. And once again, bigger samples are going to vary less. So we get a standard deviation of 0.0389. Now, once again, I got to check the conditions. The only way the center is going to be what I want it to be, the truth, is if I have random samples and it did say that. We also need our samples to be independent or we have to at least assume they're independent. So we need to make sure our sample size of 150 is under 10% of the population. So that way we can assume independence. And lastly, I want the shape to be normal. When you're working with proportions, the only way the sampling distribution is guaranteed to be normal is if you have 10 or more successes and 10 or more failures in your sample. So if I take 150 and I multiply it by 0.4, that, excuse me, not 0.4, I'm so sorry. 0.4 is what the question asks about. The truth is 0.35. That's going to be the successful people who recycle their water bottle and then multiply 150 by 0.65. Both of these numbers need to be 10 or more. That way I could use the normal distribution. Otherwise, it's too small. And voila, definitely got 52.5 people that I expect to recycle. And I also have some people, obviously, they're going to not. And that's going to also be more than 10. So as long as those numbers are both more than 10, I could use a normal model. If I could use a normal model, hey, I could go ahead and find probabilities. So now let's get to the question. What is the probability that the sample proportion, remember, there's hundreds of thousands and millions of possible sample proportions, but I want to find the probability that a sample proportion is more than 40%. So I'm going to go ahead and get the z-score for 40% now that I have the mean of 0.35 and the standard deviation of 0.0389, and that z-score is 1.285. So now i got to go to that normal model, that normal distribution based on z-scores, and 40% is at a spot that is 1.285 standard deviations above the mean. And now I just got to find the probability that a z-score is above that, which would in turn be a sample proportion above 0 0.40. And of course, I'm going to go ahead and grab normal CDF to do that. I love normal CDF. It really is one of the most useful things on the calculator here. So we want to look above. So I'm going to start at a lower value of 1.285 and go to an upper value of 99. Again, that's acting as my infinity. If I haven't said that enough. And we get 0 0.0994, 0 0.0994. So it would not be weird at all, would not be unlikely. Please, 9, nine almost 10% is not weird. It would not be that weird at all if we did get a sample that was more than 40% that recycle a plastic water bottle after using it. But again, another representation of how we could take proportions and use the normal model as long as we build that sampling distribution with a mean and a standard deviation, and you got to make sure it's normal or else, well, you can't use normal CDF if it's not. So hopefully this was a quick video that just shows you the many different ways that the normal model could be used. Multiple choice questions. I'm usually talking four, maybe even five questions that utilize the normal distribution. And then when you get into inference, which is using sampling distributions and p-values, you're going to be using the normal model as well. Or if you're working with means and sampling distributions, especially for inference, for, you know, like a t-test, you're going to be using a t-CDF and t-scores, but really they act a lot like normal model and z-scores, so just got to know how to use them. All right, that's it. Hopefully you understand how powerful the normal model can be and when to use it and how to use it.